Welcome to the Resilient Longevity Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Stephen Sideroff, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Rob Lufkin. Rob? Hey, Steve. It's great to be here. Uh, telemedicine is finally coming to longevity, and today we're joined by one of the experts in the field that is developing this space, Daniel Topic. Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Rob, uh, Steve. It's 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 great to be with you guys. It's exciting that uh, this community is. We're all getting together and talking about our favorite subjects, rapamycin, all the all the good stuff. Yeah, yeah. This is good. This is going to be so much fun today. Yeah, yeah for sure. Dan, uh, why don't you begin by telling uh, the audience how you got into this field? What what intrigued you to to step into this area? Yeah, so my background, I, I went to UCLA studying molecular biology. I did some post-grad work there. I was studying the intersection of TOR and neurodegenerative disorders. So particularly Alzheimer's and sort of the, the how the overactivation of the cellular complex that dictates protein synthesis within the cell uh, dictates when a cell is going to replicate, release growth factor, um, how the overactivation of that molecule was leading to these disease states in Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. And it was clear to me from this research that the, the way that we were manipulating that overactivation state was through diet. So we were providing uh, these animal models, protein, um, a particular abundance of an amino acid called leucine to stimulate this, this uh, TOR molecule. And we were seeing that the proportion of mice that were that when we overactivated TOR had this disease, these a higher proportion of Alzheimer's and, and Parkinson's disease. So when you're looking at it, you you say, hey, you know, it looks like as 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 animals, we have more control over the biological levers of aging then this is just something that happens, aging is something that happens over time with wear and tear. There seems to be these, these evolutionary, this evolutionary programming that responds to lifestyle choices that, that we make that either accelerates or decelerates aging. Most of that can be a function of lifestyle changes with diet and exercise, right? So uh, in our case, we were overstimulating TOR through the administration of a lot of leucine in, in the mice's chow. But in humans, observationally, we can see that there's this whole population of obese people that have a higher proportion of of these age-related chronic diseases and, and at younger and younger ages. So my thought was like, if people can understand what the levers that they're playing with, so, you know, on a standard American diet, people are playing with the metabolic levers um, of consuming too much essentially more nutrients than, than the cell needs. And it's overstimulating these, these uh, pathways that lead to cellular growth and excess and dysfunction. Um, if they can understand how they can ma manipulate those, those levers in their favor, they can start decelerating the progression of aging and lead to a life with an extended health span Meaning health span, the definition would be the time the period of your life that you're not dealing with an age-related chronic disease. We manipulated the, the outcome of what proportion of these animals uh, had had this like had Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease by also administering pharmaceutical 
uh, molecule. So in our case, it was metformin. Eventually, we started playing around with rapamycin. And we saw the augmentation of we weren't seeing these mice end up in this end state of, of having these age-related chronic diseases, these neurodegenerative disorders. So there is something about once you can modify these lifestyle pieces and if supplementing with some of these pharmacological interventions as well, there's humans had more control over the aging process than we would 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 think that sometimes you know uh, we get the we get a, a terrible disease and it's it's a function of our genes, but it's also we have ways to diminish the the likelihood that we have cardiovascular disease, we have neurodegenerative disease, we have cancer. Ultimately, the reason why we started our telemedicine practice was, while I think in the research community it's abundantly clear that there are these interventions at play that that are uh, very interesting to us, whether they're taking some of these these medications that have proven some benefit to longevity and lifespan. That pipeline from the research community to the clinical front line is definitely broken. Like I went to go see, I was interested in taking metformin uh, because I knew the research behind metformin. When I went to talk to my PCP, my PCP thought it was crazy that a 35 year old would want to take metformin, right? Let alone, you know, immunosuppressant drug like rapamycin. Yeah. I, by so, the way, I had I had the same experience with my primary when I approached her with the similar question. You're perfectly healthy. Why would you want to take uh, a medication for diabetes patients? And so we're, we're looking at the landscape of options for people. And it was clear that people that are, are intimately knowledgeable about the patients who are knowledgeable about what's happening in the research community didn't really have a clinical home to go see a physician to you know see if taking some of these medications uh were appropriate for them so we wanted to create a clinical home for people that are interested in senescence as a driver of aging um, we'll talk about that was one of these conserved evolutionary responses that seems to be driving aging. We created our telemedicine practice, HealthSpan, to solely focus on this one pathway, cellular senescence and tour-driven aging um, and connecting patients with physicians and therapies to to attack this specific uh, pathway of senescence formation. We just wanted to give those patients a home where they can go and actually find, uh, some, find someone that they can talk to about taking these therapies and you know, also doing it in a very safe way where it's administered by a doctor and they're not ordering the medications from you know, some lab or um, that's unvetted and stuff. So it's just make the, bring this to the mainstream in a way that it's, it's, it makes it safe uh, for, for patients. Yeah, this is such an interesting area. Before we dive in, maybe you could, and you hinted at this a little bit before, but maybe you could just summarize kind of your, your approach to uh, the way you conceptualize longevity and aging, why do we age, that, that, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So aging has, for the longest time, we thought of aging as kind of wear and tear. You use it, you abuse it, and eventually you get cellular degradation, right? If you think about aging as these these uh, these cellular programs, right? These evolutionary conserved cellular programs. If you think about it from the standpoint of what happens to a, uh, a, a cell that has incurred some injury, right? 
a cell that is exposed to a, 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 a carcinogen um, that has damage has three fates. So it can go through the process of apoptosis, which is cellular death. So across all of our cells, there's multiple mechanisms where we can just kill in response to injury, the cell can self-destruct, right? And when this happens, you know, billions of times, um, it, it, it's it's a healthy process. When when you have injury to cell, you don't want it to replicate such that that injury, that uh, dysfunction uh, creates its own line. So you have a, 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 a damaged cell line from that point. So the other the other outcome is that that negative state, which is tumor genesis, right? So unmitigated growth, un, uh, the cell keeps replicating, the damage spreads. And then lastly, we have a way to, to there's another evolutionary conserved way to stop that tumor genesis, which is senescence. So senescence is this state in which there's the uh, there's arrested development, right? So you, you're, the cell is not allowed to replicate. It's 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 um, there's a blocker in its cell cycle to to when it's exposed to growth factor, it doesn't replicate, which is great, right? So you're stopping the harm that uh, that can spread from that damaged cell. But as we as we age, we accumulate more and more of these senescent cells, right? And our body has, at, at, when we're young, we're able to kill the senescent cells at a similar rate to the, the rate at which we're accumulating them. The problem with senescent cells is they, ex when they're exposed to this growth factor, they have they exhibit this what this deleterious effect that Mikhail Blagosonin calls hyperfunction. So they will grow. They exhibit something called hypertrophy. Their surface area grows larger than a normal cell, right? So they're much larger than a healthy cell, which has implications that that cell now has preferred access to nutrients, right? So this damaged cell line has preferred access. It has more glute channels to get uh, peripheral glucose into the cells over, you know, your healthy cells. It has, it exhibits uh, something called hyperplasia. It releases, it secretes more uh, mitogenic factor and growth factor. So it's growing adjacent cells in a way that's very unhealthy. And lastly, um, it has this hyperfunction. So it's, 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 you're, you're, you're um, secreting and creating more proteins, degraded proteins, dysfunctional toxic proteins that are highly inflammatory outside of the cell. And so you're, you're basically, if you look at most disease states, it's these diseases are a function of cellular excess. So if you look at uh, wrinkles in a, in, in humans, it's the, the keratinocyte is producing too much keratin in balding. The, there's too much, uh, androgens being produced. This, this excess production and neurodegeneration, which we started with, it's, uh, it's overproduction of tau proteins, right? That's creating this inflammatory response. And so these senescent cells are kind of become these like Frankenstein's monsters. They release all these inflammatory molecules and they have this, this characteristic called the, uh, the SASP. So the SASP is the senescent associated secretary, secretary phenotype. If you look at a senescent cell around it, you would see a lot of inflammation, right? And that inflammation drives further transformation of healthy cells into senescent cells. And so the rate of transformation of healthy tissue into 
dysfunctional tissue, dysfunctional tissue uh, accelerates, right? And so the idea is through metabolic processes, through diet and exercise, things that uh, you both are both very passionate about, we can modulate that, that acceleration. And through supplementation with, uh, with things like metformin and rapamycin, you can also slow down that, that acceleration. That excess is driven by that molecule we started off, started out with that cellular complex called TOR. And when TOR is, is presented with excess nutrients in the form of glucose and amino acids, it says, hey, there's a lot of energy right now. Let's let's build. This is let's go in a growth phase. Let's let's do a lot of protein synthesis. Let's let's uh let's grow in the, the hypertrophy expansion. So if we 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 can through lifestyle measures, through diet and exercise, we can clamp that that core activity intermittently so you don't want to always uh uh inactivate tors uh behavior you want to do it cyclically um so that you get the benefits of cellular growth in certain phases of life and you get the benefits of being in a slightly catabolic state where you're 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 not getting this excessive cellular growth and you're internally consuming some of these these harmful, deleterious, misfolded proteins. Um, but it is to say that we have control over the formation of senescent cells through those lifestyle and pharmaceutical interventions. One quick follow-up question is, um, you mentioned, and we're going to talk more about uh, lifestyle uh, methods and, and also primarily about your program with telemedicine, with pharmaceutical methods for uh, turning down TOR as a way to uh, affect senescence and increase possibly longevity. In in mentioning that, you you mentioned the the usual thing, which is uh, TOR is a nutrient sensing program. So we want to avoid the nutrients that stimulate TOR, and there are two broad groups that you mentioned. And of course, everybody knows about carbohydrates and uh, glucose sensing for TOR. So we want to lo lower the glucose spikes, and we'll talk about ways of doing that. But you also mentioned the other, the branch chain amino acids, primarily things like leucine and all. Do you think it's valuable, um, you know, in your work with the with the animal models as well? I haven't seen people talking about a low leucine diet uh, or anything like that. What what's your uh, take on that? I, I would agree with that. I don't think that there's there's debate on this, so it's not a it's not a clear cut uh, answer here. But I don't think that people are consuming enough protein, oh, like eating, basically having an IV of amino acids to stimulate TOR all the time. I think that, I think what the real concern is the standard American diet in which there's excess carbohydrates are, are the real problem. We use leucine because we knew that would, that would stimulate TOR and we knew that pathway, right? We don't think in human beings that if you're getting more than like three grams of leucine a day, you're you're having unhealthy tor tor levels. Now that's a debatable thing, but we just don't have enough studies to 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 say that. And I I just don't I actually don't think it's a it's a very interesting uh, study to have because that's not really. It's really like the nth degree. Um, we have a glaring problem, which is a standard American diet and, and excess carbohydrates. Um, so I, I I don't think people should be. We get that question a lot. Should I should I uh, you know, withhold my protein intake? And it, you're not eating enough protein that you're getting these these hyper elevated, uh, act activity of tour. Um, so I don't think it's something that most patients have anything to worry about. 
So just to reiterate, underline that uh, leucine is an amino acid which makes up proteins. Uh, TOR can be stimulated by amino acids, just like with carbohydrates, but uh, in our diets, proteins are not really a problem. So most people are not advocating lowering proteins. The big offender for turning on TOR is carbohydrates. So, yes. you know, we're going to talk more about acarbos and other things. So if you want to turn down TOR, scratch the orange juice, scratch the sugar in your coffee, scratch the, you know, yeah. the bread and the pastries and the, all those things. And, and the carbohydrates are really the way to go. At least is that what you're saying? Yeah. You're not eating enough. So the, the, again, the reason why leucine is of interest for these folks in labs is leucine binds to, to mTOR and it activates it because TOR is a nutrient sensing uh, uh compound within the within the cell it's really sensing glucose levels through through its its downstream kind of energy uh unit which is atp and and leucine as an amino acid can say okay we have a lot of building blocks here let's start let's start building it's a great time for for growth right like you we have the, the this human just ate a lot of food well let's start let's start growing right leucine is the, is an amino acid that triggers mTOR that's the only that's the only significance of of that but human beings are not eating enough protein systemically and we're not absorbing uh enough of that protein to to have that elevated mTOR all the time. So it's not something that I think that most patients should be worried about their protein intake. Yeah. So just to clarify the what you were saying, I, I was hearing two factors that you, uh, you identify in terms of the aging process. One is the proliferation of senescent cells beyond what the, the body is able to compensate for yeah. or take care of. And then the um, turning on of, of tour uh, that produces growth that is not healthy growth within the body. Yes. And so, so would it would you say that the goal is to keep tour at a healthy level, or would you say drive it down as much as you possibly can? No, I think that I think this is really important. People understand that TOR is a good thing in, in one context, and it's a bad thing in another. Its activity can be a bad thing in another context. If you're overactivating TOR, um, if you think about a bodybuilder, right? So bodybuilders have, as they age there, it's known that they have a lot of cardiovascular disease. They have a lot of rates, of uh, the higher rates of cancer because they're turning on TOR all the time. And they're usually doing that by taking exogenous growth factor that are saying, Tor, let's get more protein for the cells, let's get more growth. And because of that, they're growing tissue, right? They're growing, hopefully, muscle tissue to give them the aesthetic that they, that they want. But they're growing all sorts of tissue, right? They're growing, they could have, uh, you know, cancerous tissue that they're growing. They can have senescent tissue that they're growing. And that growth is it's like the air traffic controller of the cell to say grow or not grow is TOR, right? And it's responding to these exogenous nutrients and growth factor. It's in. So as you age though, we don't wanna get frail, right? That's a, one of the most important factors for longevity, right? So the, the critical thing is to get a dose of TOR inhibition, right? So that you, one of the things that is very popular is this, this concept of autophagy. In the absence of nutrients, the cell will self-clean. It will basically use uh, nutrients within the cell. Basically, a lot of misfolded proteins, uh, a lot of cellular complexes that are, are debris, essentially, and use it for energy. So that that debris is not being secreted and creating more inflammation 
Um, that is a very healthy process. And that's when you get Tor inactivated, right? This activity is, is it's in that, that air traffic controller is saying, hey, let's, let's conserve, let's use up energy, let's recycle now. To go in and out of those phases is really where you want to be. So I'll talk about my own life. So uh, I do resistance training Monday through Friday, and I have gone back to eating three meals a day. I used to have two meals a day. I did intermittent fasting, and that's because I'm in a phase of life that I needed to be. I need there's a, an extra ounce of resilience with all the stresses of running our company. Um, and so I'm having three meals a day and I'm exercising, which should be stimulating tour, right? But on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Friday, I'm doing a zone two workout. Uh, Saturday, we go to Will Rogers Park. My wife and I will go on a, a hike together. So on Friday, I'll take my rapamycin so that I get that dose of cellular cleaning, that down regulation of, of growth, um, so I get that cleaning, right? And it's not, it's something, you know, I don't have to take rapamycin every week of food. There's a sort of like, I, if I need some extra resilience or being taxed by traveling too much, it's just good to get these little doses of being essentially in its catabolic stage to, to stop the acceleration of growth. And also to get that cellular deep cleaning that you can get. And it's not just through rapamycin, you can get it through fasting, you can get it through metformin. One thing that people overdo, I think, is they'll take rapamycin, they'll take metformin, they'll take, they'll take it all the time around the clock. They're always in this catabolic phase, right? They're always in this, like, let's, let's, let's drive tour activity down that's not that doesn't necessarily mean it's the most healthy thing there there's going in and out of tour inhibition seems to be the healthy balance that you can get from being in growth phases and being in catabolic phases so that would, that's my thought on that just a quick question on the on the regimen of taking rapamycin, I, I guess we'll get into this in more detail, but um, I, my impression is that it's very important to do it either in, intermittently or yes. uh, once a week or something along those lines. Can you comment on that? Yeah, 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 that's absolutely right. So my wife is a transplant patient. She had lymphoma and, and uh, she had a stem cell transplant. She took rapamycin for immune suppression. That's the label, the use of rapamycin. And she took it every single day to prevent her immune system from attacking her host, her own tissue. That is, doing it that way gets the levels, the concentration of serolimus of, of rapamycin at a point where you're, con you're, you're constantly, um, inhibiting TOR, but you're the level, there's two complexes of TOR. There's complex one that is, uh, gets this autophagy upregulation. And there's complex two that if the concentrations of serolimus go high enough that you're inhibiting mTOR complex two. And that is when immune suppression starts to happen, right? And so that's a dangerous thing. You need your immune system to, to ward off all sorts of uh, cancer and all sorts of viruses and, and so forth. Um, so the longevity use case would be not to take it every single day because we don't want immune suppression, but take it cyclically. So take it once every seven days. So I said, I take mine on Friday. I'll take six milligrams every seven days um and some weeks i don't take it uh, I'll, I'll skip a week if, if i don't feel like I, I it's appropriate for me to take it so the you get into that short phase for about 48 to 48 hours where you're getting that kind of 
poor inhibition, you're getting the autophagy, you're getting the stem cell rejuvenation, all that um, benefit of taking the rapamycin, but then you get out of that phase. So you get back to regular protein synthesis and growth. That's the theory behind taking it cyclically and in, in the longevity use case. Yeah, that that's fascinating and very important. Uh, the dosing is is key in that, obviously. Let's talk about uh, HealthSpan, the the telemedicine company that you you founded for addressing the needs for for longevity patients. And and you and Steve both alluded to issues you'd had with. Um, uh, getting help with longevity type requests and also to talk a little bit about HealthSpan and what you do and and uh, the services you provide. Yeah, so we're a telemedicine clinic, like I said, focused on senescence. So we, again, we think senescence is a, a critical, senescence and the, the intersection of senescence and tor driven aging are a, it's a pathway of, uh, it's a mechanism that is worthwhile to focus on um, in terms of thinking about how do you decelerate the the aging uh, process. We started it because of what we mentioned. There was there's a dearth of providers that were super knowledgeable about what was happening in the research community, and we wanted to provide patients with a home where they can discern we have experts that can help our patient provide our patients with the latest updates doing a meta-analysis of what interventions are actually working and what interventions are not working right um, so we have a team of researchers on you know on our team that will do an analysis of like hey there's this new molecule what does the research say about it so there's that element. And so one of the problem is just there's so much noise in the wellness community. How does a patient understand what works and doesn't work? The second piece is, is just providing a place where a patient can talk to a doctor about taking drugs like rapamycin, metformin, uh, acarbose, these mTOR inhibitors and metabolic optimizing um, uh, interventions for longevity purposes, how do you take them in the context of, uh, of longevity and promoting health span? We do it in such a way that they don't have to be a biohacker and you know uh, get their medication from some uh, some lab in China or, or wherever. We do blood testing of our patients every six weeks to make sure they're on the right course and they're taking these medications safely. Um, and we put them on a specific protocol, an N of one. So we, by taking these, getting these data points every six weeks, we can adjust their protocol. Uh, and by protocol, I'm really thinking about a rapamycin protocol, which has to be very tailored to how they're responding to the medication itself. Um, and sometimes we couple the rapamycin with uh, insulin sensitizing molecules like acarbose and metformin for their uh, longevity benefits as well. And also to kind of, to, to, to modulate rapamycin, which is has all of these uh, these longevity benefits, but it is in some su subset of our patients insulin desensitizing. So we'd like to pair those two the rapamycin with a uh, a medication that uh, kind of dampens glucose uh, spikes like acarbose or, or metformin. So we're looking at drugs that that are modulating the senescence pathway, and we're looking at new medications that uh, are in the pipeline that are also working. Um, that you know, I, six months to twelve months from now, we could be introducing to our patients after we've researched it enough to say this is efficacious enough that we would recommend that uh, a patient use these medications for longevity purposes. 
Well, through your company, you're one of the larger providers, I think, uh, nationwide or worldwide for rapamycin for longevity. I wonder, could you comment on your experience for uh, side effects for rapamycin? How many people have to discontinue it? What side effects do you get? What are the contraindications for it? Yeah, so we, we've we had, I think, three cases of, we've had over 800 patients on the protocol. We've had three cases. We had uh, a patient who had some some infection, uh, some oral uh, periodontal kind of infection that they had. We've had very few cases of in infections, right? Because we are we are dosing the medication in a way that it's not uh, hypothetically, it's, if it's uh, theoretically, we're we're not the concentration of rapamycin levels are not. Um, inhibiting mTOR complex to to get the immune suppression. So that is to say, it's been very safe. the safety profile of rapamycin, as scary as rapamycin sounds, with the labeled indication of suppressing the immune system, is far more safe than uh, even we imagined starting starting the the protocol itself. So we've had three patients that we had to discontinue. Our doctor said it's not appropriate for you to take this medication out of our over 800 patients that um, have taken it. We do see some, uh, like I mentioned, insulin desensitizing uh, aspects of taking uh, rapamycin in some patients. So we'll see elevations and glucose levels. Um, in those cases, we do pair, uh, pair the, uh, the, the rapamycin usage with acarbose or metformin. In some patients, we do see elevated lipids as well. So there's, there's, uh, lifestyle modifications, modifications we can do or complete discontinuation of taking rapamycin, um, uh, or in some cases, all the patients will like to take a statin. And I have to ask sort of the other side of the coin. Uh, so there's relatively few uh, few uh, side effects or contraindications. The challenge for, for all these longevity interactions is to figure out how they're working. So what do you use to assess um, that the rapamycin is actually doing anything and what sort of effects have you noticed in your patients? We're, you know, I, but I, I'd say this is the, the aspect of the protocol what we're we're doing we're doing the Levine testing every six months. So we're doing a metabolic profile plus all of like the insulin, albumin, all the things are in the Levine. If you look up, if anyone wants to do a search for the biological uh, age calculator, we're seeing a reduction. We. we we send requisitions every six weeks for that test. And we do a calculation of how biological age is being moved in, in any direction. And we're seeing a reduction in biological age of for every three months of usage, it's about two and a half years. So that's, that's really promising. However, I want to say that test is we don't have the greatest tools right now to measure um, how much of the senescent burden is being reduced. With that being said, in the next six months, we're going to be partnering with a, a group that has some more precise testing on senescence. Um, the problem with these tests is they're very expensive. They're in the range of like $500. So our goal is to make these these diagnostic tools have enough scale with our program that we can drive down pricing of them and kind of continue to measure their efficacy. These are very kind of uh, novel new tests that we were, you know, they haven't been used at scale to really, uh, to really justify their, their efficacy as a, as a diagnostic tool. So, um, that is to say, we will have some more senescence testing that we will be releasing in the next six months. And we're trying to be more precise with the diagnostic aspects of our program. Right now, we're using very 
uh, very basic tools that your patients can, any patient who's listening can go ask their doctor for a metabolic profile, get the results, uh, get the results of that test, and then put the, the uh, results of that test into a biological age calculator and, and get the results for themselves. So a couple of uh, basic questions here. Um, you're, me you're making comments about cost. Is any of this covered by insurance? And I'm assuming that this does not replace someone's primary uh, uh, physician. That's absolutely right. So uh, yeah, we're not, we're not, uh, we don't, we don't substitute a, a PCP visit, right? So we, we, uh, we are this kind of additional layer of care for people who are interested in longevity protocols, right? So, and it's telemedicine based, so we can't provide the level of care that you need when you're having an acute health crisis, right? Okay. Um, the aspect of, is it covered by insurance? I know in some patients, uh, it is covered by insurance, the, the rapamycin itself. Um, so we can prescribe rapamycin ultimately, whether the insurance company covers the, the, the cost of the rapamycin is, is uh, on a case by case basis. It's usually not. I know of uh, some people, I talked about, we've talked about this, um, you know that it is covered, I think, for yourself. Um, but uh, we're a cash-based business right now because we, we're in the position where we work with doctors in 50 states and we're not, we don't want to position them with calls from the insurance company uh, of trying to justify why they're putting their patients on a uh, immune suppressant drug, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're cash-based at the moment. Mm -hmm. Do you um, uh, have any opinion about take uh, NAD? Have you thought about NAD as one of what you offer? We don't offer it uh, primarily because we don't think there's any efficacy in taking it. There's, there's, uh, um, it's not clear that it gets absorbed in the form of NAD, the actual end, pro end molecule NAD, taking it through IV or through any other module. Um, we also don't prescribe NR or NMN because of the same reasons. We're not sure that it actually uh, gets absorbed into the places it needs to outside of the liver perhaps, but so we, we, that's one thing we only prescribe at the moment, three medications, because we're convinced that they, that they uh, push the needle in terms of longevity. If we do not, we're not a wellness company in that sense, where it's like every supplement known to man will, will sell. If there's no efficacy, we, we won't, uh, we won't recommend it to our patients. Mm -hmm. What are you most excited about in this space, Daniel, either with uh, HealthSpan as a company or, or the field in general? I think that it's what I'm most excited about is this summer we saw the biggest growth. And that was because of people like Peter Atia, people like yourself, people like Tim Ferriss were talking about rapamycin. Before we were kind of in this like, you know, early adopter weirdo world, like, you know, we have this small community, we talk about it and we're kind of like uh, a very niche, niche world. And I feel like we're kind of going mainstream with, through your work, essentially, with the work of Peter Tia, who are talking about this and making, uh, making these therapeutics more well-known such that like uh, I'll bring it close to how my mom used to think like what are you taking these medications for and now she's like oh which is it do you think I should start taking them and she's very conservative in that regard so it's very exciting to see this gradually becoming more mainstream from a uh from a therapeutic standpoint, I think the idea of senolytics, so uh, drugs that target senescent cells, 
it seems very interesting the efficacy of them the knowing it the, seeing them come to market uh is well, i think we're very far away from that but that seems uh seems very interesting there's a use case of one right now called the satinib that some patients i i've never taken it but people have uh uh noticed some very positive benefits from it um that's a senolytic that's very interesting but it's definitely not something we're going to be prescribing um you know you you bring this up in your presentation the rich miller itp uh the the medications that showed efficacy the acarbose the kind of uh the GLP-1 medications, rapamycin, to see them become more of a, a mainstream, uh, more well-known and more well-prescribed in the mainstream is, would be very interesting to me. Yeah. So this is a fascinating subject and uh, the work you're doing is is really great. I think it's kind of pushing the, helping to push the envelope can you uh, give our listeners how they can reach you, what your website is? Yeah, absolutely. So if you just were found online, you go to gethealthspan.com. So it's get healthspan. And if you let us know that Dr. Uh, Lovekin, the Brazilian podcast, uh, uh, referred you, we'll, we'll provide you guys with a $60 uh, discount. And I think in the show, we'll send you, you both the, the link to the sign-up form where the patients can retrieve their discount. Um, so just get healthspan.com and you would just sign up. You don't pay anything up front. You would speak to a doctor. And if the medication is appropriate for you, then you would get charged to, uh, for, for the protocol itself. Um, you can find us on Twitter. We're always sharing at Healthspan Med. We're always sharing kind of the latest research. Um, and then we also have a community at community.gethealthspan.com where we're, share, we're sharing the latest information on the latest research. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. We'll include that information in the show notes for our, for our audience. But Thanks again, Daniel, for taking an hour of your time to spend with us and talk about the the, the great work you're doing. And um, and thanks for your your interest in this field. Oh, thank you guys. It's really, what you're doing is such a service to to making this palatable to you know the patients that we discussed prior to this podcast who are not these early adopter types. You know, these are more mainstream people that are hearing your podcast, your, your lectures, um, it's really having a profound impact. So I think kudos to you. Thank you. Thank you. This is for general information and educational purposes only, and it's not intended to constitute or substitute for medical advice or counseling. The practice of medicine or the provision of healthcare or diagnosis or treatment or the creation of a phys physician patient or clinical relationship. The use of this information is at their own, uh, own user's risk. If you find this to be on the value, please hit that like button to subscribe to support the work that we do on this channel. And we take the, your suggestions and advice very seriously. So please let us know what you'd like to see on this channel. Thanks for watching and we hope to see you next time.